Welcome to Emergency Chaos, where we provide tips and tricks to make you a better ER nurse. So today we are talking about an important topic, as they are something you will come across frequently in the ER. We are talking about seizures. We will briefly be going over what they are, then spending more time on the causes, symptoms, questions you need to be asking, what the workup consists of, treatments, and of course, ending with ER nursing specific tips. So let's get into it. Simply, what are seizures? Seizures are uncontrolled or abnormal electrical activity within the brain that can lead to alterations in mentation and in motor and sensory functions. As we commonly know, the common trait we are familiar with is the jerking-like movements patients can present with. Know that you can have generalized and focal seizures with each being divided up into different types. And then more importantly for the emergency department, you have status epilepticus. And status is defined as a seizure lasting longer than five minutes or two or more seizures without the patient returning to their normal baseline mental status. Okay, so now let's get into the causes of seizures. The list of possible causes is very long. So here I will just focus on some of the big ones that you as a new ER nurse should be aware of. The first cause of a patient having a seizure is going to be an underlying seizure disorder like epilepsy. For example, let's say that they are supposed to be on Keppra, a seizure medication, but haven't taken it recently or recently had a change in the dosing or a change in the medication, then this change can be the cause as to why the patient who has an underlying disorder is having seizures again. Other important causes to keep in mind include hypoglycemia, which is why it is very important to check your blood sugar. Then you also have hyponatremia, brain bleed, central nervous system infections like meningitis, or even a brain abscess, then also alcohol withdrawal, toxins, tumors, and even stress. And for females of childbearing age, keep in mind that pregnancy has to be ruled out as certain conditions can lead to seizures like eclampsia. Now, let's briefly go over signs and symptoms. As for signs and symptoms, we have stiffening and then jerking-like movements that we are much aware of. Then you will also see tachycardia, which is really easy to see when the patient is on the monitor. And you can also see cyanosis because if you remember, the diaphragm will also be affected. So ventilation and oxygenation may not be adequate. Then you have tongue trauma as the patient can accidentally bite their tongue while they're seizing. Incontinence as patients will sometimes urinate on themselves. And then last but not least, the patient can be post-ictal, meaning post-seizure, the patient is confused and can take time before they return back to their normal mentation. Now, let's get into some of the questions you should be asking. These include, how long was the seizure? How many seizures was it witnessed? And how did they describe the events? What happened prior to the seizure? Is there a history of seizures? Have they been taking their medications like they're supposed to? Was there a recent change with their medications? Did they hit, did they hit their head during the seizure? Have they had any recent trauma to the head? Are they normally post-icto and for how long? Are they on any blood thinners? Or did they start taking any new medications recently? So those are questions you should be asking to all of your seizure patients to make sure that you cover all of your bases. Now let's get into the workup of seizure patients. Remember that among the first things you should be obtaining regarding the workup is a POC blood sugar to ensure that that is not the cause. Remember that, get a blood sugar. Then you have labs like a chemistry panel to get the electrolytes, including sodium and a CBC. As if the CBC comes back elevated, it can signal an infectious source. There's also a toxicologic screen, which can look for things like meth and cocaine. An ECG can help rule out a dysrhythmia or other heart issue that can lead or have caused the patient to collapse, signaling, signaling that they did not have a seizure, rather a syncopal episode. A CAT scan is definitely used, especially in first time seizures, to rule out a brain pathology like a tumor, to help rule out brain bleeds, brain abscesses, and other conditions. Then we have an EEG, which looks for electrical abnormalities within the brain. An EEG is extremely useful, especially in status patients, to ensure the patient is truly no longer seizing after our interventions. 
A lumbar puncture is also useful when looking for infectious causes like meningitis and know that the, that the CT is done first to ensure no intracranial condition is present because if the intracranial pressure is elevated as the result of a lesion, herniation during the LP is a possible complication. Super quick, also, a lactate and, a, or, and or prolactin can be ordered as if these come back elevated, it helps determine that the seizure was a true seizure and not a pseudo seizure or perhaps a patient faking a seizure. Do know that these labs must be drawn immediately after the seizure to be useful, ideally within minutes. I think one thing that I forgot to put on the slide is also getting a drug level of whatever seizure medication they're on so it depends on which one they're on and that may be ordered as well to get a drug level to see if it's at the uh, if it's therapeutic as always the most important thing in the er is going to prepare as best as possible we can never know what is going to be coming to the er but as nurses we must be ready for business so being ready for business entails you have suction readily available with the correct tubing and the yonker, it means having ambu bags or bag valve masks ready, both adult and pediatric ones. It means doing your glucometer checks if needed and having the necessary supplies, including a BP cuff, pulse oximetry, a thermometer, and the leads to connect the patient onto a cardiac monitor. Remember, you should be proactive, not reactive. As always, with every patient, the ABCs need to be addressed. In one of the next slides, we'll discuss things you need to know when it comes to intubating status patients. If you want to go further in depth into the ABCs, I'll tag my video here. Things that need to occur while your patient is actively seizing include placing them on oxygen, which is commonly going to be a non-rebreather since it's easy to put on, getting IV access so medications can be given, turning the patient, getting them on the monitor, checking a blood sugar, and giving a medication to stop the seizure with the usual frontline front line agent being a benzodiazepine. You should also be noting at what time the seizure started, keeping track of the length. So again, while the patient is actively seizing, place them on oxygen, get IV access, get them on the monitor, turn the patient, check a blood sugar, and get the meds ready to go. Now, let's go into the medications that are going to be commonly used. As we discussed, the typical frontline agent will be a benzo. If the patient has IV access, usually Ativan will be given. And if no IV access is obtained, Versed is commonly used for the intramuscular route. Typically, 2 milligrams of Ativan will be ordered and redosed with another 2 milligrams or more if needed. I have seen it where up to 4 milligrams are ordered to be given, but it can also go up to 8 milligrams. For Versed, usually 5 milligrams will be given intramuscularly and redosed with another 5 milligrams IM if needed. Then, the next go to agent is usually Kepra. Phenytoin, or otherwise known as Dilantin, was used the most in the past, but there is a shift towards Kepra now as Kepra is safer with less effects and contraindications. There's also Valproic Acid and Phosphophenytoin. Then, if after these drugs have not worked and the patient is still seizing, drips of propofol, versed, and ketamine can be used, but of course, the patient will have to be intubated for that. And if all else fails, like everything possible, ha possible has been tried and the patient is still seizing, a pencil barbital coma can be required, but it comes with so many side effects that it's the very, very, very last thing uh, you can do. So as far as medications, again, the benzo will be first with the Ativan usually, usually being the agent chosen as I IV access is typically obtained rather fast. Then Kepra, and typically most of the time by that point, the seizure stops. But if it continues, and it will happen at times, then other agents that can be added on are Vaporic Acid. And again, if the patient continues to seize, intubation is considered in order for heavy duty drugs like propofol, versed, and ketamine to be used. Now let's talk about intubation. Let's say you've been giving more and more benzos to your patient and it's already been 10, 15 minutes and they are still seizing. And on top of it, the pharmacy is taking their time to bring up the other medications ordered like Kepra. 
At this point, the providers may start considering intubation in order to give stronger medications to stop the seizure, like drips of propofol, Versed, and ketamine. Because without stopping the seizure, the brain is continuously ramped up and also a lot of the workup cannot be done if the patient is still seizing. You can't go to CT for a head CT unless the patient is able to stay still. The same goes for the EEG and even the LP. And on top of it, as mentioned, it's not good for the brain to be continuously ramped up for a long time as permanent damage will occur. Now let's move on to the vasopressor. So why may getting a vasopressor ready be a good idea well first the patient is going to be unstable if they be, if they've been seizing for such a long time combine that with the medications used for intubation it can drive the blood pressure down so we can prepare by having a vasopressor ready of course coordinate with the provider ensuring that it is part of the plan as well as to decide which vasopressor is the most appropriate when it comes to induction we know that etamine is the usual go-to agent however here Propofol would be a really good choice because of its anti-seizure properties. But what do we know about propofol? It can lower the blood pressure, which is why, again, we prepare. But regarding blood pressure issues, instead of propofol, Versed as an induction agent is also a good choice and it wouldn't drive the blood pressure as low as propofol would. Next, what about the paralytic? As we know, sucks can lead to hyperkalemia and rhabdo. And if the patient has been seizing for a long time, the risk of it happening can be greater. And then with rock, on the other hand, it can mask the seizure due to how long it lasts. Meaning, even though the patient is no longer having seizure-like activity, they can still be internally seizing, but they're paralyzed, so it's not showing outward. So, what happens? So you can have different providers go about it differently. Some may only want to do propofol without a paralytic for intubation. Some may want to do a small dose of the ROG so that it wears off faster. And some still want to use the sucks since it doesn't last as long. At the end of the day, the important thing would be to treat the underlying cause of the seizure. If the seizure is a result of hypoglycemia, give dextrose. If it is a result of hyponatremia, give some hypertonic saline. If it's because the patient hasn't been taking their meds, load him up with it. If it's a brain bleed, proceed down that pathway. Again, the important thing would be to treat the underlying cause of the seizure. So keep that in mind while you are doing the interventions. Listen to what the providers are discussing, ask questions, and learn as much as you can. Most people are always happy to share their knowledge, so don't be shy, right? Ask. If you have questions, ask and learn and become a better ER nurse. Now let's get into the, some of the good stuff. We're going to talk about specific nursing tips. As we discuss be prepared be proactive not reactive you'll find that when you don't prepare you get the sickest patients like with many other conditions we see in the er especially here with seizures you must check a blood sugar as soon as you can it's always important to get a full set of vitals but make sure to grab an accurate temp to help rule out an infectious source an oral temp or and or a rectal temp are very accurate compared to the other ways we have at our disposal. If you hear the term Todd's paralysis, it simply means one-sided deficits or one-sided paralysis, and it can occur to some patients after having seizures. The issue is that what also has one-sided one -sided deficits, strokes. Todd's paralysis goes away with time, but stroke deficits can be permanent. So if your patient has this, the stroke route may, may also be followed to ensure your patient is actually not having a stroke. So just to err on the side of caution, again, if your patient has these symptoms, it may not be clear if it's Todd's or a stroke. So the stroke pathway or algorithm is also followed to ensure they're not, they're not having a stroke. And then pseudo seizures, a psychiatric form of seizures can be common. And the important thing is that these patients are not trying to fake it to them. They are actually having, they are actually having a seizure. So don't take it lightly thinking they are faking it, especially because a lot of these patients who have pseudo seizures can end up having actual seizures. On the other side of the coin, you are going to get patients who are simply faking it. So what are some ways to help differentiate? Some will 
So some people you'll see will lift the patient's arm over their face while they're seizing and then drop it. If the patient moves the arm out of the way, preventing it from hitting their face, that's one way of saying, hey, the, this patient has is controlling their movement. Also, in a seizure, as we discussed, the patient will be very tachycardic. So look for that. Like if they're seizing and their, and their heart rate is still the same, that can be another clue. Another way to help differentiate is by attempting to open their eyelids. As with seizure patients, it should not be an issue. But if someone is faking it, they may hold their eyelids shut. And then one last final way I can provide is in a seizure, patients should not respond to noxious stimuli like ammonia inhalants. And then let's keep on going with the nursing tips. Make sure to look at the tongue to ensure you did not miss trauma. And of course, as discussed, evaluate for incontinence. Don't forget to think of vasopressors during and after intubation related to the possible hypotension. And then know that the DNV must be notified of the patient's seizure. Although this falls on the provider, just ensure it does happen. And finally, as always, perform a pregnancy test on any woman of childbearing years. Now let's get into the question of the day. When is BiPAP or CPAP or just overall non-invasive ventilation contraindicated? Again, when is BiPAP, CPAP contraindicated? Thank you for your time today. I hope that I was at least able to teach you one thing. If you want to keep learning, I've listed my favorite ER nursing related books in the description with my favorite being Sheehy's and the case files as well. Please take the time to watch my other videos. Also, if you would like to help support the channel, I have nursing stickers and shirts on Redbubble that you can check out to support the channel. But again, thank you for your time today. And as always, teamwork makes the dream work. And here at Emergency Chaos, we are proactive, not reactive.